mercy triumphs at the cross. The love has come to rescue us. Jesus saves. The hope is here. What a joyful noise we'll make as we join in heaven's song to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Raise a shout to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Free at last, every debt has been repaid. Broken hearts can be remade. Jesus saves. Sing above the storms of life. Sing it through the darkest night. Jesus saves. Free at last. What a joyful noise will make. As we join in heaven's song To let all the world know that Jesus saves Raise a shout To let all the world know that Jesus saves And you save, you heal, restore, reveal The Father's heart to us
our God who reigns forevermore. Majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before Him fall. The King of kings, O oh God. You guys turn around and shake each other's hand. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Tim. I'm the pastor here at Lighthouse. Um, it's good to meet you guys. Thank you for being our guest today. Um, man, is it cold or what? Maybe not. Okay. Um, is everybody awake? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, it is definitely cold outside. It was cold yesterday. I think um, uh, it was... 12 degrees with the wind chill uh, yesterday, and uh, my wife and I felt every bit of that. We were out in the stand and and uh, still trying to get that buck, and boy, did it get cold fast. I don't know how those deer do it. I don't know how they stay out there, um, but uh, they didn't come around, so I'm thinking they're all huddled around a campfire somewhere and staying warm and not coming by me or my wife. So, but anyways, it's good to have you guys here. If you're a guest here, thank you for being our guest. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's good to see old friends that are here and good to see family back with us again. So thank you so much for being with us. We're going to receive our offering. And as we do, I'll make some announcements this morning. Let's pray. Father, um, God, um, I just want to thank you for, I want to thank you for bringing me into this place this morning. And I want to thank you for the prayers and the love of all of these people that they have for one another. The love that this church, and what I mean by the church, the people, the love that permeates from them is so genuine and so real that God, not only do I feel it and not only have I experienced it, but I pray that those who are here for the first time would also experience it as well. And I know that that love flows from the love of Jesus Christ. And God, I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful, Father, that even though we have events that happen in our lives that can throw us off track and can get our minds not even thinking about you, we can come to this place and through the love and encouragement and strength of your people, we can get our focus back. I'm very grateful for that. And Father, I pray that you will continue, continue to use these people. Father, I want to thank you again for bringing us here. I thank you for this service that we get to gather together as your people to sing praises to you, to worship you because you are worthy, to be discipled, to learn, 
to be encouraged and loved, to be strengthened. But God, I pray this morning, I pray for all of us, Lord, in not only just us as adults, but in the kids' class, Lord, that you would open our hearts and that you would feed us through your word, that Holy Spirit, you would fill us. And I pray, God, that you would strengthen us as Christians. God, as we now move into our service of offering, God, I pray that you would bless us as we continue to give back what you so graciously have given to us. And may all that comes into this place, God, be used for your honor and for your glory to do all those things that you've commanded a church to do. Thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, don't forget, just on some announcements in your bulletin, we've got Operation Backpack coming up next week, Wednesday, um, or this week, Wednesday, this week, Wednesday, and Thursday. So um, there's the time in there for Wednesday is 9.45. That's actually moved back to 9 o'clock. If you can help out at the school to unload the truck Wednesday morning, um, actually going to be there at 9 o'clock um, this coming Wednesday. We're actually getting the truck early. And so, and then, of course, same time on Thursday to sack. We always need help sacking the bags of food on Thursday nights. If you could come and help with that, it would be so, so, so appreciated. It's an element, uh, Indian Creek Elementary School, and uh, we start right at about 6 o'clock. But if you came at 5.30 and helped set up some of the tables and the, and the food and stuff, we'll get um, going on that. We have our quarterly prayer meeting starting up um, January the 6th. That's Sunday night at 6 o'clock. It's going to be worship, preaching, and prayer. We want to start this year off right, and we have those every or four times a year. And so our first one's in January. So I want to encourage everyone to please be a part of that as we continue to pray for our church, our country, and those who need Christ. We have a business meeting coming up Wednesday, January the 16th, our annual business meeting. Don't forget that. Um, Wednesday night sign-ups, I don't... <laughs> The sign-up sheet's in my office, so forgive me if you want to sign up for dinner um, to be a cook or dessert. Um, just let me know. I'll have it out here Wednesday. My apologies. I forgot to grab that. Our Christmas offering thus far is $6,298. Praise the Lord. And so the first 5000 of that, as we know, is going to Afe, the children's place, children's uh, school and medical and food and all that in Honduras. So we're excited about that remainder is going to help pay off for our new um, addition um, that's going there. Don't forget, this Wednesday, no Bible study for, um, it is uh, New Year's. And um, also, if this is your first time being with us, thank you for being our guest. There is a guest registration card on the back of your bulletin. You can fill that out, tear it off, and drop it in the offering boxes on your way out. Um, I would love to get to know you. So I say this periodically, and um, I try to not say it all the time, but I, again, try to say it periodically, that there's many of you who have never been to your home. I would love to come see you. I would love to come visit you. And the reason why is because you've never filled out one of these things. Now, um, I usually won't just show up on someone's door. Well, first of all, I don't know where you live. And two, um, I normally don't just show up on your doorstep unannounced. But if you're here and I've never brought you a pie, I would love to bring you a pie and just get to know you, maybe answer any questions that you may have about the church. So if you've been coming to church here and you go, well, Pastor, I filled one of those out and you never came to me, it may have got lost in the mail. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> But if you haven't, would you fill one out, drop it in the offering box on your way out, and I promise you, I promise you I will get that, and I will make a phone call this week and see if we can schedule the time. Pie of your choice, you can write on there what kind of pie, chocolate pie, pumpkin pie, apple pie, pecan pie, rhubarb, which is the best, and, um, but you put whatever you want, I'll bring it, so please fill it out. But I just want to say welcome, thank you for being our guest today. Let's stand again as we continue to worship. next song we're going to sing has a really important message in it that kind of talks about how really talks about praising the Lord but it kind of goes into all the reasons why we should you know God is he is the love that is in our life he is the light that is in our darkness and he gives us hope every day you know and this song really goes over all the various reasons why we should shout our praises to God and I think that's a really important thing to reflect on as we sing through this next song
is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Thank you, guys. All right. Um, if I could have your attention real quick, I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 28 this morning. I'm going to ask Scooter and Joe, would you guys do me a favor and help me grab that stuff out of the kitchen? <clears throat> Today's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'll grab these, and you guys grab that whiteboard. Welcome to Class 101. My name is Mr. Wilson. I'll be your teacher for today. And I'm glad that you guys decided to come to school or chose to come to school today because today I'm going to teach a little bit different than what I normally do and I'm going to use a whiteboard. I won't be using the whiteboard for the whole time I'm teaching but I will be using it for the introduction of my teaching. This is not in your notes, but if you want to take notes, you're more than welcome to. It should stay from there. Thank you, guys. You guys are a help and a blessing. Cha-ching. Rewards in heaven. All right. We've been, <laughs> we've been going through a series called The Church. Have you guys enjoyed this series at all? I have enjoyed it tremendously, teaching it to you guys. As God has given me this series, I've literally enjoyed bringing this to you. 
learning more things in my studies, church history. I love church history. Um, I love understanding more about the church and how it started. Even back in the days of after Christ left this earth, going into the, you know, the first thousand years to the second thousand years and so forth and how the church has changed throughout the ages and just how it all works and so forth like that. What I want to do this morning is I'm going to, this message is kind of a conclusion but not yet conclusion to the series. What do I mean by that? Today I'm going to kind of bring everything together hopefully in the amount of time that I have this morning to give this to you. Now I understand that most time we're usually here till about 1135, 1140. I will try to keep it at that time as close as I can, okay? I didn't promise, I just said I'll try, okay? So for those of you that may need to get out of here early, I totally understand. And uh, if you got things to do, totally understand. But I'll try to get us out of here in about 30 minutes. Is that okay? Would you guys stick with me till then? A few of you? Okay. <laughs> Everybody else like, I don't know. All right. So how did it all begin? Well, um, this is the earth, and I am going to try to draw, um, if you will, um, this is the, um, does anybody know what that is? Okay. Uh, that's America. Okay, yep. So way over here, and I know uh, my positioning isn't... Uh, latitudes and longitudes aren't perfect here but this is Jerusalem right here okay and in Jerusalem Mark chapter number 16 Jesus said I will start my church I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and what happened was is Jesus started his church right there and people the 12 disciples or the 11 disciples excuse me one who was Judas betrayed him and of course was not part of them but the Eleven disciples who were saved began to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. An amazing thing happened. As he was sharing the gospel of Christ, and as they were sharing the gospel of Christ, all of a sudden, people all over the place started getting saved. And as people were getting saved, matter of fact, if you like, if you like, if you look in Acts chapter number two, you'll find that this church, when it first started after the day of Pentecost, you'll find that there were 3,000 people that actually got saved that day. And the Bible says, and the Lord, now I want to make sure that you guys get this, and the Lord added unto the church those who are being saved, okay? Now we've learned that all of these people, matter of fact, um, as these people got saved, um, they sailed across, of course they I missed Italy and England uh, and, and, you know, Africa down here. But as they sailed to these new different countries, um, they shared the gospel message with all of these people, um, especially the ones here in Kansas. Um, don't want to forget God's country there. Um, and forgive me for my stick people, but all of these people just began to get saved through the gospel because these people were... Um, sharing the gospel. Now what happened was is that as these people began getting saved they started grouping together or churches were started. So all of these people would gather in groups and as they gathered in groups churches were started. As a matter of fact you read through the book of Acts and you read through the letters of Paul and you'll find that he even told Timothy, he says, Timothy go to these churches, elect elders, um, put elders in these churches, put deacons in these, by the way is it hot in here? I'm sorry, is it hot? Can we turn the air down, Joe, and maybe turn some AC? Who wants the AC on? No, I don't think so. Um, but anyways, they would group together, and then churches were formed. Um, and the reason why churches were formed was because these churches were formed to do the same thing that the church did in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, in Acts, we find this in chapter number 2, verse number 41, or 42, and it says, when the 3,000 were added unto the church, it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So what happened when these groups of people in all these different countries started getting saved, they grouped together and they started forming churches. These churches would then have elders and they would have pastors or deacons just like we have here in our church. Now, as they gathered together, they began to build these things which are called, um, well, they've been called several things throughout the ages. Um, you will know it more as God's house. Some people call them sanctuaries. 
Um, some people call them cathedrals. Some people call them, um, oh, what was it called back in the Dark Ages? Um, forgive me now, I can't remember. So anyways, it doesn't matter. It's, it's God's house and it's a building. So the reason why they built this building was so that they could then do the same thing that the first church did. And that was so they could be discipled. So they could worship. And so that they could also do evangelism. Or be taught how to do evangelism. And so they would come together in this building. Now, here's something that we have to remember. When this first started, by the way, the first recorded service that we have was back in 853, or it was 583. I can't remember. I'm a little dyslexic. It's either 853 or 583, but it was a long time ago, and it was B.C. That was the first recorded service. No, it wasn't audible, and it wasn't electronics, because, you know, it was written down. But what we have to remember is this was designed for them so that they could do this. Now as you read the book of Acts and you read through the New Testament, not only did, that, did they do that, but they also came together to do other things. Matter of fact, they came together to encourage one another. They came together to um, pray for one another. They came together to do fellowship. They came together to do communion. Forgive my penship, penmanship. But you understand that the church came together to do these things and then so much more. They had gifts. They came together to do their gifts one with another. And why? All of this was done, all of this was done so that these Christians had a place to come together as a body of believers so that they could carry out the purpose of the church. Now remember, the three purposes of the church or the main purposes are worship, discipleship, and evangelism. These buildings, or God's house as we would call that, was built for the purpose of these people. And these people are what? Class, they're Christians, right? These are Christians. So the building was built for the purpose of the Christians to carry out what the church was supposed to do. Do you understand that? Do you get that? Say amen. Okay, we all get that. So what's happened through the ages is the church is redefining itself. And that's what this whole series has been about. This whole series has been about how the church is changing. And one of the ways that the church is changing in that we are now taking this place, this building, and we are changing it into instead of being a place that is designed for these people, we are now designing the building and everything that goes on in the building, in this service for unbelievers. Now, let me just pause for just a second because I'm going to reiterate this because I know that we have guests here with us today, so let me reiterate, reiterate this. Does the church want unbelievers in it, this building? Yes! Do we want you to invite your friends, family, co-workers who are atheists, who are non-believers? Do we want you to invite them here? Yes. Do we want you to fill this building with unbelievers? And the answer is yes. What I'm trying to do is to get us back to what was all this for in the first place because I think we've lost our, not us, but some churches have lost their focus on the way church should be done or should be as and Jesus designed it. So what's happening today is the church is now redefining itself because it's changing its music, it's changing its preaching, it's changing its building, it's changing everything about itself not to be Christian sensitive but to be seeker sensitive. Seeker sensitive simply means someone who is I'm a man, I can't do two things at once. Sensitive. 
Seeker sensitive means someone who is an unbeliever but who is trying to search for God. So what we've done is what the church is doing is changing everything about that to now attract these people, which again, <laughs> we want them in the church. So this kind of like, you're going, what's the purpose of this message? Just stick with me. We are taking this and everything about it and changing it for what its purpose was and making this its purpose now. Now, is that a problem? And the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Now, now, now don't, don't get me wrong here. Understand that we want unbelievers here and we want unsaved people here and, 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 and because we want them to hear the gospel. But I want you to understand something that in this fact that when you change things, when you change what this is for, the church building, and when I say the church building, I'm talking about everything that has to do with the service, the music, the preaching, the everything that has to do with when you change what the purpose of this is, what you do is you neglect this. Are you with me? You neglect from what it was designed for. It was designed for Christians to do what? To doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, but all the other things that when you read in the New Testament was everything else. Worship and encouragement, using gifts and serving one another and just all of these things. Now, why is this, why is this not a good idea? And I'll tell you why. Bill Hybels, who is the pastor of, or who used to be the pastor of Willow Creek Bible Church, and by the way, or Willow Creek Community Church, and by the way, I'm not bashing him. I'm not bashing anybody that has a large mega church. Please don't, I'm not going that direction. Because you can be a church running 50 and be a seeker sensitive church. All I'm saying is, is you have to be careful, because here's where it is Bill Hybels, pastor of, and founding pastor of the 26,000 member. Willow Creek Community Church and his executive pastor at Willow Creek have concluded that portions of their seeker-sensitive template don't work because mature Christians aren't being produced. In their recently released book entitled Reveal, Where Are You? Greg Hawkins and er Eric Arnson reveal their findings based on a multi-year study, study at Willow Creek as well as six other Willow Creek Association churches. Now listen to this. One thing they've discovered in that the programs at Willow Creek are attractive to seekers, which are non-Christians looking for something. Unfortunately, they've also discovered that over the time, the parishioners who convert to Christianity become more and more malnourished. They aren't being fed. Why is this? The reason is, is that if you take this and design everything about this, which was actually designed for this to carry out that. But if you design all this now to attract this so that you can gain more numbers and you can build a church and you can build bigger and bigger and bigger, you neglect that for which it was built for. And what do you have? You have malnourished Christians. Are you with me? Now again, I'm not bashing against Willow Creek. I'm not bashing against anybody who's got a large church. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, is this what Jesus designed the church to do? When you search the Bible and you read this book and you study it, do you see this or do you see this? And that's the whole purpose of this series of messages is to try to get us to understand what is Jesus's purpose for the church or why did he start the church? I remember it wasn't um, a couple of years ago, um, I was talking to a pastor of a very, very large church and he said this to me and we began to discuss about church and we began to discuss about growth and so forth like that. And he says, um, he says, we've made a mistake. And I said, really, what's that? He goes, we finally learned that in our church, we're a mile wide, but we're an inch deep. A mile wide and an inch deep. What does he mean by that? We may have a lot of people, but the maturity level of the Christians is about that deep. 
where should Christians be? Well, if you read the New Testament, you read Paul. Paul even said that we ought to be mature Christians. We ought to be deepening and deepening and deepening and deepening and deepening our faith, right? We ought to be growing more and more as Christians. Are you with me? Say amen. So, with that, I know that many of you go, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't the church supposed to be about this? Aren't we supposed to be reaching out to these seeker sensitives? And the answer is yes. We do want to reach out to the seeker. We do reach out to the unbeliever. Is this what Jesus want his church to do? Yes. Remember the three purposes of the church. Worship, discipleship, and evangelism. Jesus wants his church to to grow and he wants his church to build, but he does the growing. He does the building. How does he do that? As people are saved, the church grows. Are you with me? So, with that being said, no, I will make it fall down. With that being said, what is evangelism? Because that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, what evangelism is. Listen to this. One pastor said it this way. He said, evangelism is not making of proselytes. It is not persuading people to make a decision. It is not proving that God exists or making a good case for the, fourth of, or for the truth of Christianity. It is not inviting someone to a meeting. It is not expressing the contemporary dilemma or arousing interest in Christianity. It is not wearing a badge saying Jesus saves. This is evangelism. To evangelize is to declare the authority of God, what he has done to save sinners, to warn men of their lost condition, to direct them to repent, and to believe on the Lord Jesus. That's evangelism. When Jesus, listen, when Jesus came to this earth and you read in the gospel of Luke, you see that Jesus' first message was what? Repent and believe the gospel. That was his message. Why? Because the Bible also declares that Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost, right? So the message of evangelism is the gospel message. It's, it's telling people about Jesus Christ and his saving grace. It's telling people about their lost condition. They are sinners in need of forgiveness. They're in need of a savior, what is evangelism really simply? Evangelism is really going and telling. That's what it is. Evangelism is really going and telling. Now, when it comes to evangelism, why must we all do this? Because here's the thing. When Jesus gave the direction to the church to disciple, to worship, and to evangelize, he wasn't talking to the pastor. He was talking to all of us. How do we know that? Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19. Listen to this. In all four Gospels, listen to the reference of evangelism. Jesus said in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He said in verse 19, go therefore and make disciples. Making disciples is winning people to Christ. It's sharing the good news of who Jesus is. He says, go therefore. Go is a verb. It's an action. It's go Going forth, okay? It's not come and see, it's go and tell. Are you with me? All right. Mark chapter 16. Look at Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. The gospel of Luke 24. Jesus said this, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of John, Jesus made it simple. Jesus said to them, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Who's, who, who's you? The church, the body of believers, the Christians, we are to go and tell and tell people about Christ. John Wesley, one of the great, oh my gosh, theologians and pastors of the church said, there are untold millions who are still untold. He says, you have one business on earth, and that is to save souls. Very, very good quote. Why must we all go and tell? Well, not just because we're commanded to, 
or commissioned to, but because the only way someone can be saved is if they hear the gospel message. You need to understand that salvation does not happen by osmosis. In other words, someone does not just get gradually without hearing the gospel, without reading the gospel, without being told the gospel, a person does not just gradually come to the conclusion that they are a sinner in need of a savior, in need of forgiveness, and that they need to repent and turn to Christ. That doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens because they are told the gospel. Look in Romans chapter number 10 with me. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 8. Romans 10 verse 8. Love this. In your notes, people must hear the gospel before they can respond to the gospel. Every single one of you got, that are here today that are Christians, did anyone here get saved by osmosis? No? How many of you, here's a good thing, how many of you were saved outside of this building? Like someone came to you, shared the gospel message with you, and you were saved outside of a church service. Anybody? Raise your hands real quick, okay? How many of you were, were saved in a church service? You came during the invitation, came down, all right? The rest of you aren't saved. I need to talk to you. And because <laughs> some of y'all aren't participating, I get it, I understand. Romans chapter 10, listen to this, verse number 8. Paul said, let me get back to Romans 10, verse 8. <clears throat> Am I in the right text? Romans, excuse me, yeah, verse 8. <clears throat> he says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? For with the heart, one believes, or which results in, unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him, on Christ, will not be put to shame or disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? shall be saved. Yes, we believe, we believe that, right? Are you with me? Say amen. We believe that. But here's the thing. Notice what he says. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a? We got you, Tim. You're the preacher. You're the one that's supposed to tell them. <laughs> The word preacher there doesn't mean pastor. It means a person who is a herald or a person who cries forth, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. That's all that is. And in reality, we're all preachers. We're all preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, I love this, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. People are not going to receive Christ until they hear why they need Christ. And that's what evangelism is. Evangelism is going and telling. Here's another reason why we need to go and tell. Because we're ambassadors for Christ and God has committed to us this ministry. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Notice what Paul says here. 2 Corinthians 5.18. 2 Corinthians 5.18. <clears throat> Paul says this. He talks to the church at Corinth and he says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through who? Jesus Christ. And has given us, Christians, the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? That's when two people have a disagreement and are separated and an individual comes in between those two, grabs their hands, puts them together and brings those two opposites together again. The person who comes in between the two people who have a problem with each other is called the reconciler. 
And he comes in or she comes in, grabs the two people. What's the problem? Here it is. You need to work this out. And here's how you get it right. They bring their hands together. And all of a sudden, those two people are reconciled together. The problem is, is you and I are separated from God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there's none righteous, no, not one, right? So we're separated from God. How do we get to God? How do we get connected to God again? Because man was connected with God in the beginning, Adam and Eve, right? So God created them and God walked with them. Adam walked with God the coolness of the day, the Bible says. They had conversation one with another. But through Adam's sin, sin entered the world and now death passed upon all men for all that have sinned, right? And so now we've been separated from God and now we get to get back to God. But you can't get back to God on your own volition, on your own good works, on your own good deeds because the Bible clearly states that none of that stuff works. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is the reconciler who brings us and God together. That through faith in him, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for our sins. He is now our reconciler. He's brought us back to God. We have a connection with him. We have a relationship with him, mind you. And it's all because of Christ. And that's why it says, and he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here's the gospel. For he made him, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus is our reconciler between us and God. He brought us to God. Now God says, now that we are connected, we have a relationship because of my son, Jesus Christ. Now I'm committing to you. You are ambassadors of my son, Jesus. Now I'm committing to you the word of reconciliation because now you know how people can be reconciled to me through my son, Jesus Christ. Now go and tell. Does that make sense? For a few of you. <laughs> okay, so some of you are still looking at me like a calf at a new gate. You're just like... God has committed to us. We are the ambassadors of Christ, and so therefore we must go and tell. But finally, we must go and tell because we have an obligation. We have an obligation to share what we know. We have an obligation to share with people the saving news of Christ. Why? Because we know that it is the power of salvation. The gospel message is the power of salvation. Amen? People aren't saved through music. They aren't saved through uh, 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 good deeds. They're not saved through baptism. They're not saved through church attendance. They're not saved through giving money. They're saved by the power of the gospel. Paul even told us this in Romans. I am a debtor. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks, the barbarians, and the wise and the unwise. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm a debtor to everybody. Not that I owe them money. Paul isn't saying I'm a debtor because I borrowed money from everybody. No, I'm a debtor because I've got something that I know they need. And I'm a debtor to these guys. I'm a debtor to everyone in the world, whether wise, unwise, whether big, small, great, tall, the ins, the outs, everyone. I'm a debtor to all. Why? So as much as in me, I'm ready. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Why? Because Paul's idea was... I've got something in me. I've got the gift of salvation that was given to me through Christ. And now I must tell others about this great gift. I am indebted to all those who don't know. And so Paul says, I'm ready. Why? For I'm not ashamed. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is, it is definite the power of God to salvation. To those who believe. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Are you with me? Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel because he knew it's the power of God. It's the gospel that changes lives. It's, look at me. 
I can stand here and testify. I know a lot of you don't even know me. You don't know my past. You don't know what I was like growing up. You don't know my family. You don't know much stuff the way I was when I was a kid. All I can tell you, I know me. I know Tim Wilson more than anybody else knows Tim Wilson. Well, God knows me, of course, better than me. But I know me more than you know me. And I can tell you this, nothing could have changed my life. Nothing but the power of the gospel did. And it's changed me. And it's changed so many of you here this morning. Amen? That's why we know, we know that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And we are indebted, we are obligated to tell people, listen, this is what I've got. This is what Jesus gave. And he wants to give it to you too. But you must. And you share the gospel message. Ravi Zacharias, who many of you probably listen to him on Bot Radio, who I think is one of the top or the top apologetist, Christian apologetist of our time, said outside the cross, outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is no hope in this world. That cross and resurrection at the core of the gospel is the only hope for humanity. Wherever you go, ask God for wisdom on how to get that gospel in, even in the toughest situations of life. You see, we as Christians, we're to go and tell. We're to go and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. But I want to give you just three comforts really quick, and I'm going to close with this. I want to give you three comforts to know when it comes to evangelism. Because here's the thing. When you think about evangelism, you know, the biggest fear, um, when we want to, when we think of evangelism, <coughs> is this nasty word. How many would say amen? We're all afraid. We're all afraid. And I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it again, not to try to repeat myself over and over, but we can talk just about any subject in the world. We can talk about any subject in the world. But when you mention the name of Jesus, we choke. We hyperventilate. We, you know, it's like jumping into really cold water and you lose your breath. Why? Because of fear. Why do we fear? We fear, I don't know what to say. I'm not a theologian. I, I don't know the Bible forwards and backwards. Um, um, I can't save people. What if they don't get saved? What, what if they ask me a question I can't? How many ever s said, what if they ask me a question I can't answer? Here's a, good, here's a good thing. I can give you some great advice. You ready? When someone asks you a question you can't answer, this is what you do. Ready? You just don't answer. <laughs> I don't know. Right? So what if they ask you a question you can't answer? I, I have people ask me questions all the time. I can't answer. It's like I can't answer that. But let's get back on point. Do you know that you're a sinner? <laughs> Do you know you need Jesus? You know, back to the thing. Let me give you three comforts. These are what help me, and I pray will help you, and this is also, also through God's word. Number one, you don't have to be a theologian to evangelize. And what I mean is the gospel message is an easy message to proclaim, okay? It's an easy message to proclaim. You don't have to try to convince somebody through theological debate or wise words. This is what Paul said. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. You know, pastor, I can't talk like you talk or I can't pray like you pray and I can't speak like you speak. Well, if that's so, amen, praise God because I'm not a very good speaker and you guys know I butcher English, right? Because I'm more better at it, right? <laughs> but he said, not with wisdom of words. Why? Lest the cross of Christ should be made no effect. See, we think we've got to conjure up all these great words and we've got to convince people the gospel message and we've got to use these phrases and all these quotes and quims and all these things in order... Listen, that's not what God wants. God wants Jesus Christ to save them the simple message of the gospel. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't even have to know the books of the Bible to lead someone to Christ. You can be a new believer in Jesus Christ, you know, an hour old as a babe in Christ, and you can still share the news of Jesus Christ. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 2, I love what Paul said here. And listen to what he says. He says this, 1 Corinthians 2, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come, to, come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's it. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know what's cool? It's cool when you can just share the simple news of Jesus Christ and someone gets it and they get saved. You don't have to try to use all these big words and all this theological stuff, even though theology is good and we're learning that and doctrine and all that. But what I'm saying is you don't have to have this big vocabulary in order to win someone to Christ. It's the simple news of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he can do for them. Here's the simple, another simple truth that will help you is that not everyone who hears the gospel is going to receive the gospel. Not everyone who hears the gospel is going to receive the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You know this to be true. You can talk to people about Christ and some people go, whatever, you're an idiot. You don't, oh, that's a crutch. You're religious. You're a nutcase. You're a Bible thumper. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? It's foolishness to those who are perishing. Not everyone you share the gospel message with is going to receive the gospel. You've got to understand that. It ought to break our hearts, yes, in one moment, but it also ought to bring off a little bit of pressure to say that, wow, okay, it's not my responsibility. Which really brings me to my third point. You don't carry the pressure of someone being saved. You see, I used to have this, I used to be so hard on myself when back in my early days of being a Christian when I would share the gospel and somebody wouldn't get saved and I'm going, Lord, what did I do wrong? Is it sin in my life? Did I say something wrong? Did I not use the right scriptures? What did I go wrong? Oh Lord, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? They didn't get saved. They didn't get saved. Listen, you've got to understand that you don't save anybody. You are a mail carrier. That's it. You're a ma you are a, a mail carrier that's carrying the good news of Jesus Christ to every person. That's all, all you're doing is giving it to them. Going and telling. That's it. It is not your responsibility, nor do you have the power to save anybody. Notice what Paul said. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God, what? Gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives, what? The increase. The increase. It's God who gives the increase. We just share the message. Oh, that used to bother me, and I used to like, oh man, people aren't going to say, what did I do wrong? No. Listen, I don't, it's not, I shouldn't be like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to win someone to Christ. They're going to get saved. Listen, it may not happen because it's God who gives the increase. You may just be planting a seed. The seeds, we got tracks out there on the back wall. You can take those tracks and they're like seeds. I take those money ones. Have you guys seen the money ones up there? Love those. And I take them and I fold them like this so the president's head is is sticking out like that and I just throw it on the floor like that. And then I walk down the aisle and I hide down the end of the aisle at Sam's. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm acting like I'm opening up the freezer door and I'm acting like I'm looking at the frozen lasagna but I'm looking through the glass. See the unexpected person pick that up and oh, is it fun to watch that. And, they, it, and it's funny because there's people go like, you know, they, and then they're just like sneaking into their bucket water. Then you go, But it is cool. It is cool. But that has the gospel message in it. And that is a seed. You can plant seed. But also you may be watering. Maybe someone planted a seed six months ago and all of a sudden you come up and you start talking to them about the gospel of Christ and go, oh yeah, you know, someone mentioned that to me about six months ago. You know what? God's been speaking to me about that. You know, I need to be saved. And then all of a sudden God gives the increase, right? 
Apollos water. I watered Apollos. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase, okay? Now, let me close this down because we're out of time. So I've shared with you, and you understand that evangelism is going and telling. It's going and it's telling. But why, and here's what I want to get at. Why are churches changing from the going and telling that, you know, Jesus told us to do to we're actually now it's come, coming, and see. So instead of going and telling, now it's, it's come and see. So now everything that's designed in our buildings and everything, the atmosphere, the music has changed from worship music to secular music because we don't want to offend anybody. So we want to attract unbelievers. We want to attract seeker sensitive. So we change from singing stuff by Chris Tomlin and, and uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman, whoever all the Hill song and whoever all those people are, whatever. And we start changing it to singing songs from, you know, ACDC and Aerosmith and all that stuff because we want to attract people to come in. So we change all that stuff for them. So why, why have we done that? Why did we change all that? Why are so many, so many people changing evangelism? Why are we changing everything in the church to evangelize the unbeliever? Because here's what I found out. When I did a deep study on being a seeker-sensitive church, I found out that the reason why they do that, they play secular music in their worship and everything is built around the unbeliever because it's called, that's their evangelism. That's the church evangelizing. But then the question is, as you study the Word of God and you read the Bible, is that how God designed the church to evangelize? Are we to spend millions of dollars on a building, bring in secular music, bring in very shallow, shallow teaching of the Bible or not even teaching of the Bible at all to bring in people inside the body of Christ? Are we or inside the, the building so hopefully they can hear the gospel and sometime down the road be saved? Is that the design that Jesus gave the church? Or are we supposed to evangelize the world by going out? Well, here's the thing. The reason why I see that evangelism this way, this is easy. Doing evangelism this way is easy. Because here's the thing. We could all empty our savings account and our checking accounts and we could build a big building. We could bring uh, higher, uh, you know, I know, Joseph, know wherever you're at. Um, nothing against you and Autumn and anybody that plays band, but boy, we could hire a big band up here and we could play some rock and we could go to it and we could get some people in here. But you know what? That's easy, isn't it? Because here's why it's easy. Why? Because you don't have to do anything. Let me say that again. If we do this, you don't have to do anything. You just come. And everyone else, all these things, just come and see. And hopefully... They will stay. Did you know that the church is shying away more and more from the area of evangelizing? Why? Because we want to avoid the unavoidable. Here's the unavoidable. Paul said, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us, through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are believing saved and among those who are perishing. But listen to what he says. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life and who is sufficient for these things. Do you know what is unavoidable that we're trying to avoid? You are going to stink to some people. You're going to stink to some people. Why? Because Paul said we are the aroma of death to some, but there were the aroma of life to the others. To some people we stink. Oh, get out of here. I don't want to hear that stupid stuff. Oh, get out of here, you Bible thumper. Oh, get out of here, whatever they call you. But then to some, you're like, they are like, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that news with me. I've met, I've had people several times who I've led to Christ several times in our private conversations that tell me, Tim, thank you so much. Thank you for coming to my house. Thank you for leading me to Christ. Thank you for telling me. 
You see, I'm the aroma of death to some. I stink to some, but I'm also the aroma to li of life to others and you the same. And it is something we want to avoid, but it's unavoidable. The gospel is offensive. It will always be offensive. But we must understand that it is the power of God to salvation. James MacDonald in his book, Vertical Church, said, Unless you are willing to be the aroma of death to those who are perishing, you will never be the aroma of life to those who are being saved. Charles Stanley said this in closing, God's plan for enlarging his kingdom is so simple. One person telling another about the Savior, yet we're busy and full of excuses. Just remember, someone's eternal destiny is at stake. The joy you'll have when you meet that person in heaven will far exceed any discomfort you felt in sharing the gospel. So, in closing, the building. What are we supposed to do? As Christians, we are to go and tell. And that means when we leave this place, we go out of here in all directions and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's very simple. It happens just like this. Jordan, I want you to expect, just right, stand right there. I'm going to use you as an illustration. I'm closing with this, so bear with me. You can put your Bible down. You won't need it. You're lost and an unbeliever. <laughs> your wife spoke to me and said you need to be saved. I come and talk to Jordan and I share the gospel message. Now this is how you see in the Bible, this is how it works. I come and talk to Jordan. Now I'm a member of Lighthouse Bible Church. We are a bunch of Christians who have gathered together to carry out the three purposes of the church. Worship, discipleship, and evangelize. We've been worship, we've been being discipled, we've been learning how to win people to Christ, we've been learning how to walk in our faith, we've been learning how to be filled with the Spirit, we've been learning how to grow in Christ, we've been learning how to serve one another, love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. We're learning all of these things. It's called doctrine. It's called theology. We're learning all of this stuff about Jesus. And now as a member of Lighthouse Bible Church in this place, I'm now leaving this place and I go to Jordan and I explain the gospel message of, to Jordan. And Jordan, because he's been moved by the Holy Spirit and the Bible says, Jesus said, no man comes to me except the Father first draw him. God's been drawing his heart. Jordan receives Christ and gets saved. And now once he gets saved, I say, Jordan, now that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, ne your next step is baptism. You need to be baptized and you need to be discipled. I belong to a church called Lighthouse Bible Church and there's a bunch of us that meet there on the corner of 62nd, 75. We're that big white building with the blue roof. You can't miss us. If you hit the dump, you've gone too far. But if you come back right there on the west side of 62nd, 75, you know where that's at? Right? Okay, so you need to come to church. So come here and follow me. Come on up here. So Jordan comes on up here and Jordan comes in. And I introduced Jordan, hey guys, and we're just a little small church. I, hey guys, this is Jordan Hunt, and I led Jordan to Christ, and he's come, and he wants to be baptized. And baptism is an identification with Christ, an identification with his church. Jordan gets baptized, I baptize him, or whoever is that's here that's going to baptize him, he gets underwater, he's now baptized, and now... He is part of the three purposes of the church. He's now in church. He's worshiping. He's discipling. Now, he isn't evangelizing yet because he's being discipled. But now that he's been discipled, now he's going to go off and he's going to lead someone to Christ. And while he's doing that, I'm doing that. Now, you can go, go back and have a seat. So as he's going, he's now going to grab somebody. And as I'm going, I'm going to grab somebody. And now as we both lead someone to the Lord, we come back the next Sunday. Now, how many are up here? Four. And now there's four of us up here, but two are getting baptized and they're getting uh, uh, discipled and worship now in the church. And now they go out and they meet two, two people. Plus Jordan and I go out and now we all go out and we bring somebody back. Now how many do we have? Eight. Are you with me? Do you see the rep repetition here? The Bible says, as people are being saved, the Lord adds unto the church. You see, I can't stand here and go, do you know why we have so many people come to church here? It's because of this. It's because of that. It's because of this or it's because of that. We can't say any of that here at Lighthouse. But what we can say is this. The reason why people come here is because of God. 
People are saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus will build this church. Are you with me? So do you see the importance of evangelism? It's not about, now again, then people go, well is this wrong? Is this a sin? No, it, it, we, we can't get into that area of is, is this a sin? Is it wrong? Can we do both? I think you can do both in attracting unbelievers, but don't change what the purpose of the church is for. Because if you change this for this, these will be weak. But if you keep this for this, they will go out and reach them. But at the same time, the doors are always open for the unbeliever and the seeker to come in. Because at this church, they will always hear the gospel message. Always. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and we'll close. I hope that this series has been informative and instructional, if you will. I know it has not been a type of series that is life-changing and uh, applicable to life's problems and so forth, but I think it's important that we understand as a church, even in the beginning, that this is who we are at Lighthouse. This is what we do. And this is the, this is the pathway we will take because biblically, this is right. We want all people to come in the door. We want everyone who doesn't know Christ, no matter their background, no matter their lifestyle, no matter who they are, we want them to fill in this building and we want to share Jesus with them and pray that they will be saved. But I also don't want to neglect and turn this place into some place that's made for someone for, to which it's not intended for someone to be. But we want to be a church that's discipling Christians, that's growing believers, that we are observing communion, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, loving on one another, encouraging one another, all those many things. And I pray that that never changes. If you're here this morning and you go, well, you know, after hearing about the gospel message, it's never been really clear before, I want to be saved. I cannot give you the words to say and I cannot, um, I cannot save you. All I can do is tell you this. The Bible clearly states that we're all sinners and that we're all in need of a Savior. His name is Jesus. And that by faith, if you will receive him, that when he died on the cross, he died for your sins you can be saved. And it's as simple as this. Now, I, I do this many times and I pray a prayer, but it's not the words that you speak. It's just, it's just a, it's an example, if you will. And that would be something like, Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I repent of my sins, turning away from them, and I'm turning to Jesus. I may not understand everything about him, but I do know this. I know he died for me. He gave his life so I could be forgiven. And I'm putting all my faith, all my cards, everything on Christ. I make him my savior today. Come into my life. From this day forward, God, I'm going to live the best I know how for Jesus as I grow. In Jesus' name. It's something as simple as that. So my friend, if you've done that, want to do that, I pray that you pray that. Let me know. Say, Pastor, I gave my life to Christ. I was saved. I would love to know. I'd love to chat with you. Maybe you're here today. You go, you know what? I want to unite with this church. I've been coming here for a long time. I've never verbally have joined. I've never verbally came forward and said, I want to be a part of this ministry. I pray that you'll come. Or maybe you need to be baptized. Whatever it is that God's calling you to do for just a moment, I'm going to be quiet for just a quick moment. But if God's laying something on your heart, I pray that you'll come and follow his leading.